before I introduce today's guest. As you know, uh, this podcast is free to listen to, um, and so we are supported by donations to the Skeptic Society, which hosts the uh, podcast. And more importantly, we're also um, supported by The Great Courses Plus, which is an app you get on your phone. It looks like that. You just touch on it right there, and it opens right up. And uh, like, here's a new course I'm going to start today. It's called Great Heroes and Discoveries of Astronomy with Professor Emily Lefescu. And here is like a list of the lectures. There's a total of, just scroll through them there, third, uh, 24 lectures. Each of them is about 30 minutes long. If you listen to it at 1.2 speed, which I do, that's about 20 minutes per lecture. You can learn about, let's say, what astronomy heroes can teach us, designing and building the modern telescope. Harvard heroines show us the stars. The heroic discovery of other galaxies, Edward Hubble and the expanding universe, and on and on down to discovering Pluto and the Kuiper Belt. Solar astronomers reveal the universe and, and so forth. So here's the deal. When you log into thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Shermer, you get a $30 discount off the annual uh, subscription fee and you get a free trial and it comes out uh, to about 10 bucks a month. I mean, that's that's a great deal. Uh, this is just an endless stream of content. I mean, just scroll, just you just start scrolling through. These are all the different courses they have, just course after course after course. Each of them has dozens of lectures. It's a great deal. So really, I uh, I can't recommend it stronger. Uh, go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Shermer to get your free trial and $30 discount. Thanks for listening. My guest today is... Dr. Richard Grinker, his new book is Nobody's Normal, How Culture Created the Stigma of Mental Illness. Dr. Grinker is a professor of anthropology and international affairs at the George Washington University. He's the author of several books, including Unstrange Minds, Remapping the World of Autism. He lives in Washington, D.C., his book is about um, the kind of social construction of mental illness and madness and autism and ADHD and schizophrenia and psychosis, neuroses, the whole gamut, and a history of how we came to use those labels, how the labels have been uh, abused um, and uh, to stigmatize people, control people, put them in institutions. Um, and so we go into the history of all that. We look at the problem of labeling, how the DSM, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, uh, created these categories and the lists of criteria that you have to meet to be uh, labeled as such, schizophrenia or whatever, and that the uh, uh, healthcare system kind of reinforces that in as much as to get reimbursed as a physician for treating something, you have to treat something that has a name, and therefore it has to have a um, assessment criteria or diagnostic criteria, and that's how we end up with the DSM. And um, uh, but this is not perfect. This is not uh, exactly rocket science, and uh, like engineering is, say uh, that there's a lot of subjectivity to it. The, um, the you know how society uh, treats these people and what they call it, and how it's uh, diagnosed and so on is very much subjective. We talk about drapidomania, which is the disease of Black slaves wanting to escape to freedom, you can imagine that. <laughs> or the history of hysteria, which was thought to be a woman's disorder. And then when men started uh, exhibiting the same symptoms um, during and after the First World War, um, they were called um, shell shock. So that's a different diagnos diagnosis. Uh, we look at a little bit of the history of, of uh, homosexuality and how that was a disease in the DSM all the way up until 1973. Stunning, just amazing uh, uh, to what extent uh, this is a lot of pseudoscience in this area. But Dr. Grinker shows what we can do to correct that problem. So with that, I give you uh, Dr. Grinker. By the way, I'm recording for those of you watching this. This is not my usual home studio. This is the skeptic's office. So this is what it looks like here. There's, you know, usual stuff over here on that wall and books, books and more books. There was the 9-11 uh, was an inside job. <laughs> uh, get a lot of interesting mail here. So anyway, good to be recording from a different uh, location. All right, here we go. Richard uh, Grinker, thanks for coming on the show. Your new book is 
Nobody's Normal, How Culture Created the Stigma of Mental Illness. I'm uh, interested in this subject because, uh, we well, first of all, I've never had uh, uh, somebody talk about this subject on the podcast before, and we've covered this a lot in Skeptic, uh, in as much as, you know, we're always looking for things to be skeptical of. So the whole idea of categories of mental illness and how you define them operationally in a scientific way is is a challenge and we've we've published I also we published Thomas Saws once uh who is very as you know very critical of, of yeah. psychiatry and actually I credit that with not getting sued by Scientology in the 90s we were hammering Scientology and they were suing everybody but they left us alone so I thought huh I wonder if it's because we published Thomas Saws and they don't like psychiatry and he's critical of psychiatry so maybe that got me off the hook I don't know <laughs> But my earlier connection to your work, um, when, when I was in a history of science program in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, we read um, um, the, uh, what is it? Oh, uh, Michel, Michel Foucault's Madness and Civilization, which was a real eye-opener for me because I came into that uh, field uh, w with kind of a, a simplistic, uh, you know, the, the, the arc of science is marching upward to absolute truth and and I wasn't familiar with the kind of social construction of science and the embeddedness of science and, and culture. So uh, Foucault, oh, I'm just going to read the opening uh, sentences of his book that uh, really opened my eyes. He quotes for his epigram from Pascal, men are so necessarily mad that not to be mad would amount to another form of madness. And Dostoevsky in his diary of a writer, it is not by confining one's neighbor that one is convinced of one's own sanity. And then um, Foucault picks up first sentences of his book. We have yet to write the history of that other form of madness by which men in an act of sovereign reason confine their neighbors and communicate and recognize each other through the merciless language of non-madness. We must try to return in history to that zero point in the course of madness at which madness is an undifferentiated experience, a not yet divided experience of division itself. We must describe from the start of its trajectory that other form which relegates reason and madness to one side or the other of its action, as things henceforth external, deaf to all exchange, and as though dead to one another. It took me a long time to figure out what he was talking about there, but this is really what your book is about, in a way, uh, getting back to that zero point in history and then marching forward to to current events. And, and your opening epigram of your book uh, from Ruth Benedict, the concept of the normal is properly a variant of the concept of the good. It is that which society has approved. So let's start there. Give us a little bit of background. Your, uh, your book is interwoven with personal family history because you have four generations of psychiatrists uh, who have been de dealing with this problem, including the connection to Freud, which I thought was utterly fascinating. Uh, and yet you chose not to go into psychiatry. You went into anthropology. So give us kind of a, a, a background to how you encountered this whole field and then uh, what your book is about in that regard. Well, thanks so much for having me um, on your podcast. Uh, Foucault is a hard act to follow. Uh, quite a, a prolific and brilliant writer and I love the passages that you uh, quoted because they really um, they really make the point that what we often take to be logical, reasonable, and true is what we have convinced ourselves is logical, reasonable, and true. I think that's why he uses the adjective sovereign in that sentence and says sovereign reason. Because it's a reason that has power, the power of the quote unquote expert to convince us that what we're seeing isn't just a reflection of what we've decided is true, but is in fact reality. Um, I became an anthropologist in large part because of that kind of argument that what we take to be natural what we take to be completely true is always going to be constructed and structured by the places in which we live and the historical moments in which we find ourselves. The distinction between my father, my grandfather, my great-grandfather, and my wife, all psychiatrists, um, is that 
is that I have a very international focus in my work. And I don't pretend to be, you know, taking our ideas and exporting them elsewhere. What my goal is in my profession is to go elsewhere, figure out how they are making sense of the world. And then by understanding that process, returning home and seeing our own society in a new light. It's kind of like, you know, you, you go to Europe from the United States and suddenly you see it, you, you know, very, very stark differences on the street. The cars are tiny and the streets are narrow. And then you fly home to Dallas, Texas or wherever it is. And you say, oh, my goodness, the, the cars are so big and the streets are so big. And you never really noticed that before. Part of anthropology is the comprehension of others. In order, in order to return change to ourselves and to see ourselves in a new light. So madness, in this sense, is the othering of people that are unfamiliar to us or we're just uncomfortable about uh, being around, or more to the point, I think, historically, um, what they can actually do in the world to survive and flourish in their own capacity. And as you know, industrial capitalism arises, they have fewer and fewer places to be so society ends up putting them in places, these uh, bedlam, these mental institutions, which were pretty grim for a long time. So you have a, a history of that. Uh, when I first read the Foucault quote again, I was thinking, because I have schizophrenia, a little schizophrenia in my family. I have a, had an aunt who was schizophrenic. She was homeless, living in a car in L.A. And even though my mom and, and a couple of the sisters tried to help her, she just really didn't want help. I mean, she was just obviously mentally disturbed and i figured well this has just got to be pure biochemistry and uh but then when i read saws you know foucault and then thomas saws and so on, I, I thought okay you're not denying that there's some physical ailment there wh whether you call it a disorder or, or, or a medical condition or um, whatever it, the label is there's some something going on in there that's not happening in my brain but that's not the point of course there's something but th the point is how we treat it or or, or what we do with those people yeah, you know, one of the problems in the last couple of hundred years has been the sort of separation of the body and the mind, and that we 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 try to think about mental illnesses now as brain disorders, and yet they are the product of so much complex interaction of genes, environment, experience. Uh, it's it's so seductive, you know, to try and reduce a an explanation of any condition to a set of biological causes because you know reductionism is nice they oh i got the cause it's right here the difficulty is in understanding how so many factors will come together uh, to create phenomena so you know if you take for example um two people who are identical twins and one develops schizophrenia, the other doesn't. Two people who are identical twins, one develops depression, and the other doesn't. You're not going to find, you know, you're not going to find that difference in the genes because they're 100% genetically identical. You're going to find it in other kinds of factors that uh, through the, the entire environment, in, which includes childhood, um, of these, these individuals. And so... Um, you know, we we look back in history and we see that the very first uh, people who were psychiatrists or the precursors of psychiatrists were called alienists. And in France, what they studied was mental alienation, meaning the separation of the body and the mind. The mind could no longer control the body. The body could no longer control the mind. They were separate entities. Yes, and you, you go back to Descartes on that, splitting the mind yeah, and brain. Yeah, they needed yeah. discipline and control. Yeah, but I could see um, the temptation of the medical model because, it, 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 at least in principle, it should remove the stigma, stigma of mental illness. Because before that, as I understand it, you know, these people were looked at as, you know, morally deficient or, or, or weak or there's something, you know, just like in their character that's wrong with them. But you wouldn't say that about somebody who has cancer. You wouldn't say, oh, they're morally weak, that's why they got cancer. Although maybe today you'd say something like, well, they smoked, so that was the moral weakness that led to the cancer, something like that. But 
But your point is that uh, actually that doesn't end up removing the stigma like the originally thought it might by medicalizing it. Oh, no, it doesn't. Um, you know, I think that one of the problems is that in trying to make the mental health professions the science of the brain, uh, scientists are emulating a false idol. They think the medical model is just about disease. But it's not. When somebody has a sickness, the experience of that sickness is not visible in a microscope. The experience of that sickness is that person's race or ethnicity, or whether they're living with family or alone, or whether they live in a city or the countryside, or um, whether uh, they embrace one type of therapy or another type of therapy, or whether their society has values that affect them in terms of their disease, like someone who has breast cancer and has surgery, has a, has a mastectomy. Well, in, in one society, her, the woman's ideas about her own femininity may be challenged. In another, they might not be. And none of those experiences, that, that, which is the illness experience as opposed to a you know, disease, is captured in any kind of laboratory test. And so um, the idea that somehow the, the, the biomedical sciences kind of have the, the purchase on truth and the rest of us are just doing interpretations is, is really bogus. I mean, think about how arbitrary uh, things are, are, are decided within the medical field, right? Like who came up with 10,000 steps? You got to do 10,000 <laughs> steps. Um, but, right. I mean, that's that turns out thing. to be a marketing gimmick. Of course, <laughs> and, of course. And not a, it's, tied, it's tied into economics. But, you know, then think about um, uh, what kinds of things doctors, you know, come to consensus of how many alcoholic beverages we should have per day or... Um, in the old days, it was, you know, how often did you masturbate? You could be, you know, uh, given, or they decide who you can love and who you can't love. Or the doctors decide on something as simple as a number for hypertension. Well, there is no number in nature for what constitutes high blood pressure. And so this, this is a really important point that I want, that I really want to make, which is that, um, the medical sciences are not as objective and detached as psychiatrists and psychologists think it is. Yeah. Yeah, this idea of if you can't measure it, if you can't quantify it, measure it, then it's not science. Uh, that leads us down that pathway to then every, anything that has a number that we have some consensus on, this is what it means, then that's real hard science. Yeah, to just take something like BMI, I had a previous guest talking about this. You know, this is, again, a bogus number because it varies so much. Like my BMI, you know, I'm 5'7", and I'm about 165 pounds because I'm pretty solid and, and I have a big upper body. But I'm right on the limit of obesity. And, and, and I look in the mirror, I'm like, I, I, you know, I ride my bike two, three hours a day. I'm not obese. You know, what does this number really mean? This thing is bogus. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so that's an analogy for, for that. Well, but, we start but, to think. No, but we start to think that obesity is, a, is an illness, and it's not. Right. It's a risk factor. A we risk start factor. to we think right. that high blood pressure is an illness. It's not. It's a risk factor. And what do doctors treat mostly? You know, when you go in and say, I'm feeling tired. I don't know. I'm feeling tired. I just don't have any energy. Well, there's nothing. Can't see really anything wrong with you, but I'm going to recommend right. that you take a day off from work or something like that, or you have headaches can't see anything wrong with your headaches, hopefully Advil, Tylenol will take care of it. There's no medical test there. There's no diagnosis there. Right. That's what most medical treatment is. Yeah. Anyway, so, um, you know, we also take it on faith when the doctor says, well, you have this infection of such and such a bacterium. We don't ask to look in the microscope to see for ourselves, do we? Yeah. We take that on faith. Yeah, that's so, right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so so a big part of my field, and, and I, this is really covered in Nobody's Normal, is the study of how we created certain kinds of labels, how some labels helped us, how some labels hurt us, how some labels were created and then multiplied, reproduced, and then doctors look back and said, where did all these people come from with this label? There must be an epidemic. Right. Yes, They're right. curious about the, the conditions that they themselves had counted. Yeah. Um, 
and it classified. And the history that I tell in Nobody's Normal is just replete with new terms, you know, new words that come up. Yeah. It's, it, there's a, it's a double-edged sword, of course. You know, you need frameworks and words to drive treatment, right? Uh, to frame something to be um, cured or treated. But then those to demean, to punish, to marginalize. Yeah. Um, whether in, it was homosexuality or lunacy or, you know, other, or hysteria, which is very feminized kind of um, uh, diagnosis for men. And uh, the problem is also that we often internalize the beliefs about those labels mm, yeah right so if we learn from our society that people with schizophrenia are such and such a way and we d and the person develops schizophrenia they may think and feel right. in that way that society's prepared them for right yeah the couple examples that you gave that's in kind the of internalized stigma, self stigma yeah, that's right. Yeah. So in Nobody's Normal, you have the discussions of hysteria. Well, men can't get hysteria because that's a female disease. So what are these soldiers after World War II experiencing? Oh, shell shock. That's a much more manly kind of disorder than hysteria. <laughs> but even that's funnier. That's how it's unpopular. Yeah. Even funnier than that was the drapedomania, which is the tendency of black slaves to want to escape to freedom. And, you know, they just can't. That's not normal. They're, they're supposed to be slaves. They're supposed to love slavery. So this must be a disease. It that is, that, that is amazing. The yes, I mean even masturbator was a was a diagnostic term at one point. <laughs> yeah, right, a, a problem. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, and much of this has to be driven by the healthcare system and how um, how reimbursements are made, at, at least particularly today, to be reimbursed by your uh, by the healthcare system. You have to have treated something. So we have to call it something. And then we have yeah. to have a list of characteristics that uh, defines that thing we're treating. I remember back back to a medical example, driving my stepdad around to various uh, doctors when he was in his 80s. And he was, you know, he was just like in your 80s. You're just, you're, you're in pain. You have this and that. And they couldn't pinpoint anything. And, you know, I know I got seven minutes with the doc, right? There with my dad. And it's like, and he's like, well, how about this? How about, no, I just feel like crap. I don't have any energy, this and that. And then finally the script comes out, right? All right, try that. And then bye. And it's like, oh, you know, come on. Well, sometimes actually, you know, the, the, the treatment will drive the diagnosis. Mm. Like you don't know what something is. And you say, well, let's try lithium. Lithium works, and you say, "Ah, well, he must have bipolar disorder." Oh, I see. <laughs> right. right. Okay. <laughs> so even the treatment can can sometimes go the other way. Yeah, yeah, that's disturbing. But back to the social context again. Thinking about my aunt with schizophrenia. Had they lived a thousand years ago, let's say on a farm, and you know, and my mom and her sister, or whatever, they all shared the same farm building or something, and then maybe my aunt would have just lived next door, and she would have helped out with the chores or something, rather than living in a house, a car, and in downtown LA and therefore she wouldn't have de been defined as bad. Just like maybe she's quirky or, you know, you know, quirky aunt, <laughs> something like that. It's possible. I mean, it is entirely possible what you're saying. It is also possible though. She could have been, you know, shackled to a, a tree. We don't oh, know. Oh, as a witch right? or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> right. It could, it could go, it could go another way. But having said that, it's really important to understand that there have been some really robust multi-decade longitudinal studies about how people fare over time in different kinds of contexts. Mm. And probably the starkest difference is that in health organization studies that showed that while the prevalence of schizophrenia throughout the world is pretty much constant at about 1%, people with schizophrenia episodes, more severe episodes, and poorer outcomes in industrialized urban societies than they do in rural non-industrial Really? Wow. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. A, a, a place in Nigeria and a place in India, they do better. They marry. They have children. They have work. Uh, and you compare that to Washington, D.C. and London, mm. and you see a real stark difference. Now, no one knows exactly why, right? But the kind of going theory is that it has to do with uh, 
networks and social supports. Mm. That in these non-Western societies or non-industrialized societies, that people are embedded in a, a network of multiple caretakers, friends, mm. and relatives that minimize the severity of their illness. Even if, yeah. I haven't looked at the literature on schizophrenia, but I think you said in the book, uh, if you slid a, a schizophrenic into a fMRI brain scanner, you wouldn't see anything. There's no obvious. Uh, I don't know why they said that, but. Um, or something. There's no obvious uh, medical problem or tumor. The equivalent of like, well, oh, there's a tumor there. That's the problem. Yeah. What I what I was trying to say is that, the, that brain images um have not yet been translated into interventions and treatments mm. and the identification of specific causes. Mm. But yeah, I mean, there are, there's a lot of neuroimaging that shows distinctions in the brain between mm. different kinds of uh, people with different uh, conditions. Sometimes these are almost like animation, like they'll, they'll be in children, there will be um, images of uh, the cell death, because we have too many cells when we're born, and then we, they, they kind of get pruned. Um, yes, over time pruning. <laughs> yeah and um but if you look at that pattern of pruning they're distinct in people with autism or schizophrenia or other mm. conditions mm. and it's really fascinating but does that help the person with those conditions mm. we don't know you know that that hasn't happened yet and as much as i support you know personally just as a, a social scientist a scientist a citizen um all of the wonderful neuropsychiatric and neurological research that's going on. Um, in many studies, in fact, most studies, uh, this turn to see psychiatric conditions as brain disorders has actually exacerbated stigma. Mm. That there is less stigma when we see it as a complex result of many forces when we see it as a response to environment um when society takes some of the blame or something else takes some of the blame like a war or a virus mm. uh, like a pandemic and then there's more stigma when we see it as oh this is a problem within that individual and so by the end of nobody is normal i'm basically saying we need to stop assuming that when somebody is suffering it's their fault or it's something that's wrong with them. When the kid at school isn't behaving well, uh, you know, in, in terms of what's defined as well, mm. it may not be that there's something wrong with that child's brain. Why don't we also say, is there something about the way which we set up our classrooms that right. makes it right. for some kids to be a quote, person experiencing homelessness? Is it possible that that person has some brain disease? Yes, it is, but it is also very, very likely that this person is experiencing homelessness because they're the product of discrimination or bias or poverty, or some kind of other issue. And whenever, whatever society we look at, and I talk about Japan and Korea yeah, and yeah. lots of places, African societies, this, this holds up. When society takes some of the blame, when something external takes some of the blame, and it should, we decrease stigma. Right. Yeah, I was thinking about that because you have a discussion on ADHD in the book. Uh, I have a four and a half year old son and he is high energy, very physical. And he's just got to move and move and move his body. And, you know, we're six months away from putting him in a classroom with rows of desks or whatever they're doing. At, yeah. You know, and I'm just thinking, this is not good. So we're looking at the Montessori school now because they're running around and they're doing stuff. And it's like, who came up with this idea? We're going to put them in rows, you know, and then you look into it. It's like, well, it's kind of a 19th century industrialized <laughs> we're going to build little citizens <laughs> to go to work. <laughs> there is there is a set of fascinating studies um, by Sarah Harkness and uh, Charles Super at University of Connecticut, um, where they looked at children with the identical uh, symptom behavioral profile, but in different countries. And then mm. they talked to teachers and parents about them. And uh, so a child who is uh, what we would call hyperactive. Italy was thought to be, was described with terms like energetic, curious, outgoing. <laughs> and in Sweden and Denmark, they were called uh, difficult. 
<laughs> right. And it's the same, the exact same children, right? Right. Yeah. That's so funny. That's such a, and worse, but what if you treated it with something? You gave them what, it, I don't know if Ritalin is still the preferred medication. Um, exactly. But the, yeah. So my guest last week um, was uh, Kevin Dutton. He has a book out called uh, Black and White Thinking. So he, he opens with this, uh, what's called the problem of the heap. It has a technical problem in, in, in mathematics. But, um, uh, you know, wh- how many grains of sand constitute a heap? You know, so does one grain? Mm. No. Two, if you add one grain to one grain, yeah. is that a heap? No. How about 10 grains? No. <laughs> but at some point, you know, like. 10,999, you know, it, one more. Okay, but we've already established that adding one grain does not make a heap. But if you have, at some point, there's a subjective leap you make from quantitative to qualitative. You go, yeah, that's big enough. That's a heap. So I was thinking about this listening uh, to your book. I listened to the audio version. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, you talk about the history of the DSM and, you know, and, and the attempt to, to, to make it more rigorous and objective and yeah. quantifiable. So instead of clinicians just talking, sitting around, uh, you know, having a cigar and, and a whiskey talking about their, their patients and what they're going to call them or, you know, what the uh, uh, symptoms are, we're going to lay this down. And these are the 12 things that define ADHD or schizophrenia or manic depression or whatever. How many do you have to meet to, before you get the category? I mean, is it 10 out of 12 or 6 out of 12? Or maybe there's mm-hmm. 25 and you got to do 20 out of 25. You know, there that seems like you're uh, at some point, psychiatrists are making some kind of subjective decision that's not really scientific. It's just like, that's enough. I feel like that's now this label. Yes. Yeah, so how do they make those decisions? The, um, the color spectrum provides an interesting analogy, you know, because we know the difference between orange and yellow. But I don't think that anybody's going to agree on exactly where on the color spectrum it turns exactly <laughs> yeah. from yellow to orange yeah. or orange yeah. to red, right? Yeah. We have to make a decision about that. Similarly, you know, what's the difference or what is the point at which shyness becomes autism or sadness becomes depression? Right. These are very difficult assessments to make. And somebody might even meet the criterion in the DSM for a particular mental illness. But that also doesn't mean that they need treatment at that time. So we don't know. But um, the point usually is when there is undue suffering. Mm. significant enough suffering that your life is impaired Mm. when you get from sadness to depression that's when you can't sleep that's when your social relationships get messed up your work life is messed up when you can't when you're contemplating suicide and you may not be safe and so that's when these diagnostic categories can become really useful because they do provide a framework that then motivates a certain kind of intervention yeah doesn't the intervention doesn't you know mental health care doesn't have to mean a psychiatrist doesn't have to mean a psychologist it could mean any number of different kinds of counselors it could mean support from family it could mean having more zoom calls with your relatives <laughs> what, but 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 you need care you need something to change to yeah. help you yeah yeah it's like the discussion of uh, pornography addiction or video game addiction or facebook addiction or whatever you know, when does it become an addiction? Well, I guess if you lose your job and your spouse leaves you and 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 so on, well, you have a problem. Exactly. That's exactly right. And um, but we have to be careful. You know, there's a proliferation of categories out there. And sometimes even though we think that mental illness categories are, you know, somewhat objective because there are symptom checklists. Yeah. They are applied differentially based on location, based on class, based on race. I mean, in Nobody's Normal, I talk about the history of doctors misdiagnosing African-American men with schizophrenia instead of depression or of mm. African-American children being uh, labeled uh, having conduct disorder in school and their white counterparts with the similar symptom profile are called autistic. Um, so. Um, the the history of the stigma of mental illness 
is a, a one-sided thing where you have a series of experts who are seeking to define um, human behavior. Um, it cross cuts or it's intersectional to use the you know, more popular word these days, uh, whether it's sex, race, uh, class. Um, I mean, we know that um, women were seen to be more prone to mental illnesses mm -hmm. throughout much of the 20th century that the word lunacy comes from moon, and that was related to um, ideas about menstruation, menses mm. coming from moon as well. Right. Yeah. So um, there are all kinds of really, really interesting, but also, you know, disturbing um, relationships in which you can see that domination in one sector of society is related to domination in another. Yeah, you have that great phrase, the invention of the female. <laughs> yeah, you know that it's so hard. That is so hard for people to grasp. Um, it's not uh, because people aren't educated <laughs> or smart. It's because it is so counterintuitive. Um, a, a reviewer thought that it seemed silly. How could I say that there was no category, separate category of female until the um, late 1700s in Western Europe. Right. But there was only one sex. Right. And it was male. Right. And women were different from men, but women were thought to be a different expression of the same underlying sex. It wasn't thought that they were two distinct sexes. And when scientists developed this idea that there were two biologically different sexes and that men and women weren't just different manifestations, of a one underlying sex, it wasn't because of any new scientific discoveries. The doctors who said, well, we don't have any terms for the female um, genitalia, were internal scrotum for the uterus. Mm. We're using internal testes for mm. the ovaries. You know, we got to come up with some terms that are just for the female. When they came to this, it wasn't because they had any new microscope <laughs> or new fancy equipment. Um, it was because capitalism demanded that we have very, very fixed and distinct cultural and biological identities. Yeah. By the way, since we're on that subject, do you have an opinion on the tra current trans movement and then the pushback by some people like Abigail Shire's book uh, uh, about harming our daughter? I forget the title. I think it's harming our daughters or something like that, that there's like in, in high school and colleges, there might be a social pressure to identify as trans, uh, which is neither here nor there. But if you take medical uh, interventions to make the transition and then later you change your mind, you could have you know done permanent physical um, changes that are irreversible. I don't know if you have a, have a thought on that since we're right in the middle of, of that uh, movement. Well, that's a very thorny I know. question <laughs> yeah. um, that I will answer by referring listeners to an opinion piece that I published in the New York Times oh, okay. maybe a year and a half, two years ago, um, which argued that um, people who are transgender um, can have mental illnesses like anybody can have a mental illness. But being trans in and, itself, in and of itself is not a mental illness. Yes, clearly. Yeah. Yeah. No one is immune from getting a mental illness. The problem is when uh, the experts will pathologize um, certain kinds of identity and self-identification, just as was done with just as was done with homosexuality, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and doctors were, you know, they were certain. They didn't think, oh, we're making an interpretation. They were certain homosexuality is a mental illness, and so, too, do we have a category of gender dysphoria in the DSM? Oh, dysphoria, uh, right. It's a, it's a disorder. Mm-hmm. Right. So, and it wasn't until the seven, 19, 1970s before homosexuality was taken out of the DSM. It was pretty late game, I think. Yeah, 73, maybe, 74. Yeah. It was an interesting study. time because the, the, the um, psychiatric community was trying to get rid of homosexuality. But they were also trying to add um, post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm. And they were trying not to be psychoanalytic about it because they were trying to make psychiatry much more scientific. 
and less Freudian and interpretive. And it was a tough one because um, the uh, logic for putting PTSD in the DSM was that there was unconscious memory and conflict, and it was very Freudian <laughs> that could endure right, and give right. you emotional hardship forever. But the, um, uh, you know, but they wanted to get rid of homosexuality um, also by saying that it, you know, had no bearing in any kind of science. So they were using science to get rid of homosexuality, but psychoanalysis to try to get it into the DSM at the same time that there, it was just a, a, a mess, a yeah. real mess. And um, it was an interesting story, too, that I tell um, in the book about how that happened, how they got homosexuality out of the DSM. It was gay psychiatrists who did it. Really? Okay. Yeah. I mean, All they right. were they were closeted. They had right, wives. Right. Right. Children. They were grandmothers, or whatever. But but um, you know, they in those days a lot of people didn't live a gay life openly, so they married, had kids, whatever. Um, put together and kind of plot to get leadership positions within the American Psychiatric Association, and. Then um, one very prominent psychiatrist, John Spiegel, became the uh, president-elect uh, just at the time when the DSM, they were getting a homosexuality out of the DSM. And it, it was only some years later that John Spiegel came out to his granddaughter, mm. the journalist Elise Spiegel, uh, to say that he'd always been gay all his life and mm. that even his wife had known when they married that he was gay. I remember calling my father, who's somewhat conservative about sexuality, and telling him about John Spiegel, that John Spiegel had been, you know, closeted at the time that he spearheaded getting homosexuality out of the DSM. And my father said, that can't be. And I said, well, I, you know, there's this wonderful uh, show, This American Life on NPR about it, the whole, about the whole thing. And he said, but John was your grandfather's best friend for so many years. Your grandfather would have known. And I said, Dad, do you think it's possible that John and Grandpa were more than just friends? <laughs> that's great. And he hung up on me. He did? Oh, my God. Yes. Oh, that's hilarious. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, uh, I was thinking about, again, back to the trans thing. Um, and the emphasis now seems to be it's, it's very fluid and it's sort of, uh, you know, it's a personal choice. It's a, a, in a way, a lifestyle choice. You can choose to be this gender or that gender. And I, I've noticed some of the gay communities pushing back against that, like Andrew Sullivan, who's a, a pr pretty prominent uh, public intellectual and a gay conservative, which is unusual and Catholic. <laughs> uh, you know, he, it, it, his argument was that, you know, we spent decades arguing that this is not a lifestyle choice. We're born this way. I've always felt this way. And so one of his op-eds, he said, he wrote to kind of addressing these young um, men who say, I'm attracted to other men, so maybe I'm secretly a woman inside. And Andrew's answer is, no, dude, you're gay, like me. It's okay. You can come out now. You don't have to do all this other thing. Okay. I know it's it, it's con controversial, but it's I, another topic, and it's very political. Every every few years, some magazine comes out with a poll that shows that there's a real strict division between the republic people who identify as Republicans and people who identify as Democrats. With Republicans generally seeing uh, homosexuality and being trans as a choice, right. And Democrats seeing it as something that's in in nature, right? It's, it's a pretty pretty consistent thing overall. So I mean, it, it's 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 fascinating how uh, politics enters into the way in which we interpret human difference. We, you know, whether it's the way psychiatry was was deployed to keep slavery alive, the way psychiatry. Yeah. Um, you know, was employed to discriminate against people who are gay um, or in the more sort of obvious cases where in the Soviet Union, um, people who 
were dissidents, people who fought against the system were often labeled with schizophrenia and institutionalized mm. as a form of political discipline. Yeah. I want to talk about David Rosenhan's study, uh, such as it as it was, I don't know if you'd call it an experiment, but more like a, a street theater <laughs> uh, kind of a performance. But, it, uh, you know, he wrote that famous paper, uh, Being Sane in Insane Places, published in Science. You talked about that. Um, it, when, when I initially encountered that in your book, I thought, uh oh, because I wrote a lot about that in, in the believing brain in the context of the power of, of like the confirmation bias. And once you have a label or a belief, everything seems to fit it. So I'm just going to read a little bit of that. Um, it, uh, just for listeners not familiar with that, uh, uh, David Rosenhan was a, is a, a psychologist at Stanford and he, he managed to get himself and some of his grad students and some friends, uh, uh, introduced it or uh, entered into these mental hospitals. All he told them to do was go in there and say, you you, uh, you you hear things like empty, hollow, thud, and if pressed, they were to interpret the meaning of the voice's message as, my life is empty and hollow. All eight were admitted, seven of them diagnosed as schizophrenic and one as manic depressive. They were, in fact, a psych grad student, three psychologists, a psychiatrist, a pediatrician, a housewife, and a painter three women and five men, none of whom had any history of mental illness. Okay, so once they got in, then he said, you, you have to get out on your own. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> anyway, I don't know to what extent um, you think this is a worthwhile activity, but the, the, the power of belief of the label itself, it seems to be the, the poignant take-home from that uh, demonstration. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know if you've read Susanna Cahalan's uh, new book, The Great Pretender, but uh, she goes through great sleuthing to really uncover good evidence that the Rosenhan paper, the whole study, was really largely a sham, a lot of it fabricated, oh, and no. that Rosenhan was himself some of these pseudo patients. Um, so, but but it it was an important phenomenon in the history of mental health professions because it was in the early 1970s when psychiatry had come under real attack. And this was a damning paper for the leaders of psychiatry. It made it seem like psychiatrists couldn't tell the difference between someone who was sick and someone who wasn't sick. One person in the field uh, said, you know, it was ridiculous. It would be like, you know, you in his example, you drink a quart of blood, <laughs> go to the emergency room, vomit up the quart of blood, and then criticize the doctors for admitting you for a possible ulcer or <laughs> right. internal bleed, right? I mean, they pretended to be sick. It's also a strange study because even at that time, you couldn't just commit somebody for long periods of time to a mental institution unless you had a, um, a, a judge to sign right. a warrant to that effect. Right. And it would involve consultation with family and there'd be legal representation. And I mean, it just, it just sort of didn't make sense. Right. But the paper got a lot of traction because it resonated with a lot of people's fears that these labels were meaningless just as you pointed out. And it was at a very, very tough time. It was also the time that um, there were people who were arguing against homosexuality being in the DSM. There were people arguing about the uh, fact that the mental health professionals in this country were ignoring vi uh, domestic violence, were ignoring the trauma of Vietnam veterans. Um, and there were psychiatric hospitals that were being revealed in exposés to be horrific places. Yeah. So it was a tough time for the mental health professions. When that paper came out and we read it, I was taking an abnormal psych course, actually, at Pepperdine University in Malibu. And as part of our course, we had to spend one day a week at Camarillo State Hospital, which is just up the PCH there, about 45-minute drive. And it was grim. I mean, this place was like right out of one flew over the cuckoo's nest. And the uh, I realized then I didn't want to be a clinician. I wanted to be uh, like an experimental psychologist, not a clinical psychologist uh -huh. in that big divide, because it was just so depressing to be there. 
And uh, so that that paper resonated with me, uh, although I never really thought about it because I don't. What do I know about how you get into a mental hospital? But I presume you could not just walk in and say, as he said, uh, "My life is empty and hollow," and I hear voices that say "thud." They're not going to just admit you just because of that. On that one, on the basis of one thing. I mean, even at that time in the early 1970s, um, many people with psychosis, most people with psychosis, were being treated as outpatients. Mm. Right. That just doesn't, just doesn't make much sense. But but it's a it's a it was an important period of time because uh, of, you know, of what it meant. Yeah. Uh, and, and how it stimulated an anti psychiatry movement. Yeah. Um, you know, Jeffrey Lieberman, uh, who's the chair of psychiatry at Columbia, is always sort of shaking his head saying, you know, there's no anti cardiology movement. There's no anti obstetrician <laughs> movement. Yeah. We've got this anti-psychiatry movement, and why is that the case? Yeah, you know, reading your book, it was in a way depressing how primitive this so-called science so don't of... Say my work, so don't say my book is depressing. No, no, not, no, no, the, the history is depressing of, of, of how long it's taken us to get to where we are today, and I still feel like we have a long ways to go to really understanding mental illness. So if we could, you know, pull back, I know you got, got a hard out here with some more interviews for your book. But if we could take a look at the bigger picture, you know, like like going forward, you, uh, it, it is your your book does end positively that we've gotten rid of a lot of the stigmas. You know, we've come a long way on the stigma issue. But uh, how do you see us uh, really grap grappling with the problem of mental illness itself and what to do about it, both medically and also social, socially and culturally? Yeah, I think there's I mean, there, there was a whole lot that has to be done. You know, we have to realize that mental health care, as I said earlier, can mean many, many different things, not just going to one particular type of of, of clinician. We need to, uh, I think, have multidisciplinary teams in clinics and hospitals so that uh, you're not separating out psychiatry and siloing it as a, uh, you know, as a, as a separate profession. Uh, psychiatrists repeatedly report being uncomfortable in emergency rooms because the um the the emergency room physicians don't want them there and mm. they don't want psych patients even because they you know it has something to do maybe with the god complex they want to mm. fix things and psychiatric conditions aren't particularly easy to fix you know uh so i think we have a long way to go as well with uh with training uh, there are people who graduate from medical school and go through their full residencies and have very little exposure to mental illnesses. And yet they're going to encounter this in their patients. Yeah. You know, in Southern California here, I don't know how it is where you are, but we have a massive uh, homelessness problem, N not just here, San Francisco also. Um, and apparently a, a sizable percentage of these people are mentally ill. Uh, you know, so this idea, well, just give them homes or, you know, throw money at them or, you know, they just they just need to get a job. I mean, this is just so unrealistic. How do you reach those people, given what's happened since Reagan, you know, back in the 80s, shut down all those mental um, hospitals and redirected funding? And, you know, that that's how we kind of got started down this homelessness problem in the first place. You know, I hear stories of people in European countries that have government funded health care that say, you know, oh, there's a homeless person in the same hospital suite that I was in. Hmm. And I'm, you know, a lawyer or I'm a doctor. <laughs> um, there isn't a, you know, kind of separation there. Um, you, we do seem to have one health care system for the rich and another health care system for the poor. And I think it's really crucial that we appreciate that having a mental illness has serious physical health consequences as well. People with a mental illness are more likely to be homeless. Yeah. You're more likely to be homeless. You're more likely to be malnourished. You're more likely to be exposed to violence and to be a, um, a victim of violence. If you have a mental illness, you're more likely to smoke cigarettes, drink, uh, excessively, to have fewer social supports. And we know that um, mental illnesses have severe uh, physical health consequences. Uh, a Lancet paper recently reviewing 69 million records in the United States since COVID found that people with a mental illness are more likely to contract COVID. 
Oh, wow. Right. They don't cause it. Why? But Well, probably they're just maybe not as uh, careful about masking or they're probably closer to other people to, to spread it. Something probably simple like that. Well, it could be many, many factors. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, but the thing is that I am not a Pollyanna, and I'm not only focusing on the positive in this book, but I do want to point out in conclusion that the reason I wrote the book was not to point out the terrible things that have been done in the past, but to trace how we've gotten to a better place now. Mm. I mean, when my students are open about their mental illnesses, I just uh, I beam at them because I feel that they're taking ownership of it, that they're advocating for themselves, that they're not seeing mental illnesses as a mark of shame any longer. Mm. When I hear a celebrity talk about their struggles with mental illness, it has a lot of meaning. When Ron Artest right. was being interviewed, when the LA Lakers won the champion, uh, NBA championship a few years ago, he said on national TV right after the game, I want to thank my family, my coach and teammates, and my psychiatrist. Right, I remember that. When, David Letterman went on right. stage at the Kennedy Center to get the big Mark Twain honor for American humor. He brought his psychiatrist with him right. on right. the stage. Um, this is an important message. It conveys something really, really important to the public at large, yeah. that mental illnesses are part of things to be human. Yeah. And we got to talk about it. We got to treat it. Uh, and we, we can't uh, hide it away as if it were a secret. That doesn't help anybody. Is that uh, sort of like uh, Temple Grandin being labeled autistic? And here she has a Ph.D. and and gives talks at TED and, and, and so on. Uh, or maybe Bill Gates is on the spectrum or whatever. Since your previous book was on autism, just say a couple words about, about that as a label and the stigma and how that's changed. So. When my daughter was born in 1994, we didn't really think that people who had, sorry, she was born in 1991, she was diagnosed in 94. We didn't really talk about people with autism as having a success in the world. You wouldn't have thought that you know, Bill Gates could right. be construed as someone um, with autism. But today we have autism hiring programs at uh, computer coding companies. Uh, we recognize that autism is an enormous spectrum that can include people who are in, so you know involved that need they need lifelong care, but also people who can excel in Silicon Valley. And those two things, the the two sort of sides of the spectrum, the people who really really need help, and the people who didn't get maybe noticed before, but had real struggles socially right. and in communication have all been helped by the neurodiversity movement and this new openness that my students and the celebrities I've talked about represent. It's a tide that raises all boats. Yeah. Yeah, that was a touching section talking about your child. It reminded me of Steve Gould's uh, essay he wrote about his own son, who was autistic, and but a, but a calendar calculator. He, he, he's one of these guys you could say, you know, what day was it on December 20th, 1563? And, oh, it was this yeah. date, you know, so on. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> I mean, so, yeah. I'm so, uh, so, Michael, I don't know if you can maybe stop the interview where I said, like, you know, where I kind of gave a summation. Yeah. I was going to read the final paragraph of your book, which is really beautifully written. Sure. And then we can, then we can, yeah. we can go. Yeah. Okay. Consider that when children have difficulty sustaining attention in school, our first thought is to change the way they behave rather than to question the way we organize our classrooms and schools. When someone is homeless, our first thought is that the person has failed as an individual rather than to question the historical legacies of discrimination and inequality. When a person does not fit a pre-existing or assigned sex or gender, our first thought is that the person has a mental or physical disease rather than to question our definitions of normality. Expectations of child behavior, discrimination, and gender conformity do not cause mental illnesses, but they do cause stigma. The challenge now is to learn lessons from the past and from other societies and harness the creative power of culture to reduce both stigma and the fear of stigma. If culture puts stigma and mental illness together, culture can surely begin to take them apart. That's a that's a great closing paragraph. 
Thank you for your Thank work. You. Thank you for your work. This is really important. Thank you. You're it's welcome. been a pleasure talking with you. For this episode, I'd like to uh, do a special thank you to our new sponsor, Ground News, which is an app you get on your phone that looks like this. You just touch the app and it opens right up and you get uh, breaking news stories and updates on news stories and so on, but not from the left or the right or any particular uh, media bias, but from all different perspectives with a uh, bias grading for each particular story. Now, let me tell you why I love this app, because here is yesterday's newspapers that I have to go through uh, to try to get a balanced view. I have the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, and for good measure, my local paper, the Santa Barbara News Press. Uh, this is a lot of work. <laughs> Uh, I consume a lot of paper, and I spend a lot of time grinding through articles to try to figure out what's really going on. So Ground News actually takes a different approach in improving the broken media ecosystem. They are a news comparison platform, giving you the ability to compare how sources with different biases are covering a story, so you can easily see if it's being spun to fit a political narrative. The app, which you get on your phone... Uh, also alerts you to any news blind spots that you may have, stories that are only covered by one side of the political spectrum. So as a listener of this show, I would like you to go to ground news, ground.news slash Shermer and download your free app. That is go to ground.news slash Shermer and you can download the app for free. And it just takes just like two minutes to sign up and open an account and you're rocking and rolling here. You can just scroll through and see what are some of the breaking stories. Here's like the coverage bias of this particular story on Trump's tax returns. You can see there's a lot more blue than red in there. And on the other hand, there's a lot more red than blue in this next story about coronavirus and so forth. And uh, so anyway, thank you for supporting the show. Uh, ground News, and again, ground.news slash Shermer, and that gets you to your free app. Thanks for listening.